welcome to Depth Insights, where we take a depth psychological look at news, topics, and events that are going on in your world. I'm your host, Bonnie Bright, and I'm also the founder of Depth Psychology Alliance, which is an online academic community for everyone who is interested in the field of depth and Jungian psychologies. And you can join Depth Psychology Alliance at www.depthpsychologyalliance.com. It's really the first community online of its kind where you can find events going on all over the world in the field of depth psychology, as well as view videos. There's a discussion forum. There are blog posts from multiple of our members and all kinds of great opportunities to connect and really go into depth, so to speak, with other like-minded people. So I welcome you to come and join us at DepthPsychologyAlliance.com. Meanwhile, today's show is very exciting because I have two guests with me today. We're in for a real treat, and I think that you will agree once you have a chance to get to know both Naomi Ruth Lewinsky and Patricia Damry a little bit better. Both of them are Jungian analysts and authors, and they have just released a new anthology called Marked by Fire, Stories of the Jungian Way which is published by our friends Fisher King Press, by the way. Fisher King Press has been a tremendous supporter of Depth Psychology Alliance, and we're just really thrilled to have that ongoing partnership. Uh, And this book, Marked by Fire, contains some remarkable essays by quite an impressive array of Jungian analysts, I would say. And some of you may know already that Marked by Fire is the July selection for the Depth Psychology Alliance free online book club. And to join that free online book club, you can just go to Depth Psychology Alliance and look for the book club in the link at the top of the page. And, of course, that is free to join, and it's all done in a written forum so that anyone who is interested can do that on their own schedule and at whatever level of participation works for them. So let me give you first some background on both of my guests. First, we'll go to Naomi Ruth Lewinsky, who is an analyst member of the San Francisco C.G. Jung Institute and also a widely published poet. And Naomi's recent memoir, The Sister from Below, When the Muse Gets Her Way, tells stories of her pushy muse, as she calls her. (laughs) And Naomi is also the author of The Mother Line, Every Woman's Journey to Find Her Female Roots, and three books of poetry. The most recent of those is called Adagio and Lamentation, and features lots of poems about her own grandmother, who was a refugee from the Shoah and a fine painter. Naomi says her grandmother taught her the practice of making art of one's life. Naomi, it's really my great pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you so much, Bonnie. It's great to be here. Welcome to you. Let's go then to my other guest. Patricia Damery is also an analyst member of the C.G. Jung Institute of San Francisco, and she's in private psychotherapy practice in Napa, California. What's unique about Patricia is that she and her husband farm a biodynamic organic ranch, and Patricia has published numerous articles and poems and also two books, which I personally love, Farming Soul, A Tale of Initiation, which weaves an absolutely fascinating tale of her analytic training and also her simultaneous entry into biodynamic farming, along with her latest novel, Snakes, which is a story about the demise of the family farm and the impact on one family. And that is also published by Fisher King Press, by the way, and their selection of books from unions and psychologists is quite extensive, so I invite you to check out Fisher King Press as well. So meanwhile, Patricia, it's great to have you with me. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, I'm just so thrilled to have you both here. Now, both of you have been with me before. It's been probably a year ago or so, and so anyone who's listening to this actually who has not heard those interviews from last year might want to go back and listen to those when they get a chance. You can find those at depthinsights.com, D-E-P-T-H-I-N-S-I-G-H-T-S, Dot com. And, of course, most people who listen to this podcast regularly realize that Depth Insights is kind of the media arm for Depth Psychology Alliance. It's a nice partnership between the two, Depth Insights and Depth Psychology Alliance. So, again, both of you are here with me today, of course, because you have co-edited this anthology, which has just been released, Marked by Fire, Stories of the Union Way. So, Patricia, I think this is such an interesting idea to ask Jungian analysts about their stories, and I'm really curious about how this came about. Can you just share with us a bit about the beginnings of the book, the idea, how it came to you, and and really how the two of you began collaborating on this? Originally, Mel Matthews asked if Naomi and I would like to collaborate on an anthology. And we had been thinking about doing some work together around um, what Naomi terms Jungian memoir, 
which is really this very personal way of writing about the experience with the unconscious and using that in professional writing. So, Naomi, you may have some things to say here, too. Well, I think the first thing I want to say is that I had, for many years, had a recurring dream, and occasionally I would say this dream to Patricia because it always puzzled me. I said, <laughs> Patricia, I had that dream again. You and I are in a country kitchen, and we're cooking up potatoes for the Jungians. Yes. What do you think that's all about? <laughs> and, you know, we talked about root, we'd talk about root vegetables, and we'd talk about both of our uh, deep feeling for the feminine and what could be more feminine than being in a kitchen and cooking. But when Patricia said to me that Mel had had the suggestion, I thought, ah, that's what the dream's been about. We have to <laughs> feed the Jungians root vegetables because for me, I felt kind of like a, a lonely outlier until I started hanging out with Patricia and until I found Mel as my publisher with this idea that expressing what you get from Jungian psychology is a very, very deep and personal experience and that writing from that deep personal experience conveys something that can't be conveyed by more academic writing with lofty concepts and clinical material. Yes. Um, and so I think of Jungian memoir as the kind of memoir that includes the depth of the inner life and what happens in the inner life. And our culture is starved for any kind of acknowledgement of the inner life. So I think yeah. maybe we want to feed yeah. root vegetables to more than just the Jungians. We're hoping to feed root <laughs> vegetables to more than just the Jungians. Yes. Yeah, I absolutely agree, and that's a, quite a remarkable dream. Of course, I relate to it quite strongly because I grew up on a farm and we grew potatoes. So <laughs> that's a, a, a personal <laughs> aspect for me. But you know what's interesting, actually, what you're saying reminds me of what, what I noticed about the very first section in your book. It's called Might of the Earth. Yes. And it's under section one, starts on page five for those who have the book. And, of course, it's a quote which is fairly well known, I think, in certain circles from from Carl Jung. And it says, life has always seemed to me like a plant that lives on its rhizome. Its true life is invisible, hidden in the rhizome. And, of course, rhizome meaning the root or the underground parts. And right. so I think this is so profound, the way that you are sort of weaving this story of of the dream and how you guys began collaborating together. And, of course, Patricia has a farm, and, <laughs> and now we, here we are talking about potatoes. And, you know, it's, yeah. it's quite remarkable. But I think this um, this comment about how we're starved for, for really what is spiritual in our lives is, is very significant. And it's something that I've also done a great deal of reading about and thinking about and, and even writing about on my part and I'm just so grateful for Jungian psychology for that very reason because it's, you know, truly a lot of people ask what depth psychology is. And, of course, Jung was one of the founders of depth psychology. Depth psychology encompasses additional thinkers beyond Jung now. Yes. Uh, it's kind of evolved that way, of course. But But most people who don't know much about Jungian psychology really – maybe what they need to know is that it's really kind of one of the more spiritual sides of, of psychology and, and definitely contains a lot of those aspects that the pure scientific branches don't really include. Right. Uh, and and so really, this is, again, you know, one of the reasons that I'm so profoundly intrigued by your idea of bringing union analysts into this to share their work and their stories because they can talk in such authentic detail about what has gone on for them from direct experience. Yeah, we um, just have a couple of um, professors from Pacifica who are not Jungian analysts, Dennis Slattery and Robert Romanishan, but they're certainly Jungians. Yes, yes and they're definitely in, involved heavily in the depth work. In fact, right. I have had right. both of them as, as professors in my own career at Pacifica. And yes, they're very immersed in that world and I think highly qualified, as are all of your contributors, to be able to actually talk about this topic. And while we're on that note, let me just share with you for all of our listeners who the contributors are so that you have an idea of it if you don't have the book in front of you. So, of course, Patricia and Naomi, both of you have contributed chapters to this, but also Jerome Bernstein, who has had one of the most powerful impacts on my life, uh, in fact, with some of his work and his book about borderlanders in particular. Mm -hmm. And then Claire Douglas is a contributor, as well as Gilda France. A lot of people know her name. Jacqueline Gerson, Jean Kirsch, Chi Lee, Carlin Ward, Henry Abramovich, Sharon Heath, and, of course, as you mentioned, Dennis Slattery and Robert Romanishan. 
And so that's a, a pretty remarkable lineup. And again, it's really wonderful to be able to sort of take a peek into their inner world where they share what they've learned with us. But speaking of this direct experience and what you've learned, Patricia, let me ask you, is there anything that you've learned about the process of editing the book? Because this seems like such a, a huge task to be able to do, to put this all together, particularly with all of those contributors and getting everything together and, and doing the actual editing. Is there something that you've learned about editing the book that has been really meaningful to you? I think maybe one of the most important things I learned was to trust the process, to trust what came, what um, as Naomi and I w were choosing the authors, we really wanted to choose authors that we knew could write personally, because not all authors can do that. Many will use intellectual concepts, but not be able to articulate them in this very rooted, in the root of one's being way. <laughs> and so we we very quickly, in some ways, chose this group that ended up to be just right. And then we went to Truches, New Mexico to edit the book. And it was truly a magical journey. I feel like exactly what we needed arrived. It was like being on a pulse. And to me, it really is a metaphor. It, is, it isn't always pleasant in life. <laughs> Some of the things we meet are really quite dark, but it's just right. What what comes to us is exactly what needs to be there. And in the case of Marked by Fire, most of it was quite stimulating and numinous, the way we found the cover, the way the authors, the energy that rose as people wrote about their experience. I think that's another thing I learned is when you really start writing from the root of your being, there is an incredible energy that builds. And it is one that unites us with each other. And I think that was really something that happened in the process of this book, that the authors became very connected to each other, although there were several of us who had not met each other, except through email and through our stories until we got together for the book launching in L.A. And interestingly enough, all but two of the authors who were not able to come came to the book launching at the Los Angeles Institute. And, and the two that weren't able to be there were there by Skype. Yes. Bill Bernstein from um, New Mexico and Henry Abramovich from Jerusalem, believe it or not. Yes. Wow. It was just amazing. And there was this enormous spirit you yeah. know, to to everybody wanted to be a part of the party. I mean, we were drinking imaginal champagne on email. For <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very exciting, and I think what you're referring to, what it makes me think of, is this idea of soul appearing in the work. It feels like soul just manifesting to create these synchronicities and these connections between people, yeah. but also in the editing process of being in a place that was also lending its energy to you to be able to do the work that you were doing. So I find that really profound. And, of course, you know, Jungian psychology is all about soul. And there's something that you mention in the beginning of your book on page two, which, of course, a lot of people who know about the life of Carl Jung and his own journey, which ultimately led him to write the Red Book and move more deeply into the work that he contributed to the field, he really opened to soul in a way that allowed him to manifest certain changes in his life. Let me just read this paragraph from the beginning on page two. As I mentioned, it's the second paragraph. And you say, When soul appeared to C.G. Jung and demanded he change his life, he opened himself to the powerful forces of the unconscious. He recorded his inner journey, his conversations with figures who appeared to him in vision and in dream in the Red Book. Although it would be years before the Red Book was published, and of course that came out in 2010 as a side note, much of what we now know as Jungian psychology began in those pages when Jung allowed the irrational to assault him. That was a century ago. So in some ways, and always maybe, soul is so, so timeless. And again, it allows things to converge in a way that is very profound for us. 
And Naomi, I'd like to ask you, because I know that you feel strongly that Jung's Red Book actually influenced Marked by Fire. Can you talk to us a little bit about why you feel that? Well, I mean, I'll tell you that uh, the Red Book just was so powerful for me, and I write about that in my piece at the end of the book, because, you know, Jung, I love Jung, and he totally changed my life, but he always was a bit of a suit. He was a professor. He had a pipe, and he distanced himself from the arts, and he didn't really want to admit that he was an artist. And if you want to hear more about that, you can read my essay because I don't want to go into the details of it. But when I read the Red Book, I saw what the whole thing was all about. The guy is a total artist. And he was totally open in this very, very raw, vulnerable way to the incredible forces of the unconscious, which can be extremely dark, as Patricia has said, and very dangerous. And he stood up to all of it, and he wrote it all down, and he painted it. And I just felt like... Well, no wonder I've always been so drawn to him, and no wonder he had to kind of put his suit on and act like a professor because everybody would have thought he was crazy. And I've sort of been in that situation often with people thinking, aren't you being a little extreme here, Lewinsky? You know? <laughs> I had a, an interviewer recently say, because I was talking about talking to my ancestors and talking to my grandmother, and he said, well, don't people think you're a little nutty when you say that? I mean, like your grandmother's actually there. And I said, well, yeah, I think a lot of people do think I'm nutty. But my grandmother is there, and of course she's not there. I mean, both things are true. So I felt so vindicated. Let me tell you, I felt vindicated when I read the Red Book. And I had the privilege of doing a program on it, so I spent a whole year really going over the Red Book and over the Red Book and over the Red Book. And so when Patricia and I started talking about this book, it just made sense, the Red Book being the quintessential Jungian memoir, to use a lot of quotes from the Red Book and to kind of base our sense of what we're doing, that many of us have our own experience. And you can read, you know, like when Henry Abramovich describes his experience, what brought him into Jungian psychology, it was a version of what Jung went through. He had this tremendous confrontation with these very powerful forces from the unconscious. And in various versions, people all did that. Mm -hmm. So I think the Red Book stands right behind this book of essays where those of us smaller, ordinary folk are telling our versions of it. Mm -hmm. There's a quote from Carrie Baines that we have right. on page three that I really love from the Red Book. She says of Jung's writings, I always knew he must be able to write the fire he can speak, and here it is. His published books are doctored up for the world at large, or rather they are written out of his head, and this is out of his heart. Mm. And I think that is true. I, I, I remember when... The Red Book came out, and we ordered it through our institute, and many of us had not seen it. So we, we went to the membership meeting, and they had the Red Book there. And I remember sitting at the table as they were passing out these enormous books that weigh 10 pounds, <laughs> and you wouldn't want to drop on your foot, and just being in awe. All of us, is like we'd all been waiting to see this. Right. And it really was. It felt like this is out of his heart for sure and something else, something very, very deep in his heart. And, and I feel, feel like an ancestor got released, you know, like the full glory of this ancestor got released? Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, and one thing that uh, if, if for those of you who have not actually had the opportunity to see Jung's Red Book yet, I, one thing I'd like to mention is just that not everybody actually knows what a – very compelling artist Carl Jung was. He right. really has some of the illustrations that he has included in that are so absolutely sublime and really beautiful. I find myself sometimes just staring at them, you know, and losing track of time because there are so many details to them. And of course, there's a lot of symbolism in there that even at some deep study, you don't always recognize until you start to have it pointed out to you. But very powerful, the imagery that he has used. And, and I think that also impacts the psyche quite profoundly. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about your own contributions through the writing in this book. And Naomi, you mentioned your piece, which comes at the end. And, of course, Patricia, yours launches the book as the first piece 
in the anthology. Yeah. Can you tell us, Patricia, just a little bit about your own piece and if there was anything that really affected you in the writing of that? I was surprised as I wrote it, and I'll also say that several authors said they learned something about themselves as they wrote their piece. I did, too. I remember when I was becoming certified, Don Sandner was my control analyst. And he said to choose 10 dreams, six or 10 dreams, whatever, and to string them together like a pearl necklace. And so I immediately had some dreams that came to mind. One that was one of the more mysterious dreams of my my life, really, that was never interpreted in my analysis by any consulting analyst that I ever met with. It really was one that was left to me. And I think in writing about this, which I won't go into too much right now, but in writing about it, it really helped me to see it was a major pearl in this necklace, so to speak, and that it really has defined my life. It had to do with the life force, the the Manitou, and particularly the Manitou, the the life force of the land that we live on here in the United States. It was a particular American concept of the divine and the divine in matter. And it happened very early. It, It happened in a way that I really had to seek out what it meant, and it kind of I, it helped me meander into work with archetypal imagery. It it is one of the dreams that really makes me believe in the unconscious. My unconscious knew things that I did not know, so I was very stunned by the imagery of the dream. So I think in writing it now and looking back on it, I really see how there was this coherent path, which I wouldn't necessarily think of, and this dream was a part of it. Thank you for sharing that. You know, a lot of times I think when we move into the writing piece of things, it can really serve as a a vehicle to be able to convey something that is often sort of beyond our capacity to articulate. I wonder. Yeah, you know, if... I just wanted to share that I happened to be with um, Gilda Franz in L.A. this weekend, and and she's a a contributor to this book with just this wonderful essay that has a lot about a very chaotic and difficult childhood. She's 85 years old, and she's, you know, done umpty ump years of analysis. And she she laughed and she said, you know, the thing that really was wonderful for me about being able to write for your anthology was that I learned something totally new about myself. (laughs) I just felt like I was being thrown around in my childhood. I didn't realize that I made a choice. And then she described this moment at which she made a choice which brought her mother there to rescue her. (laughs) So I was so delighted with that to learn that at 85, you know, she's discovering new things when she writes about herself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And lucky all of us because we'll have the opportunity to both read the book and also to study it in more depth through the online book club on Depth Psychology Alliance in July will allow us to actually learn some of these things before all of us hit 85. (laughs) So I'm looking forward to that very much. You know, on that note, Naomi, I so appreciate the examples of Gilda's contribution and what stuck with you about that. Are there other examples that you can share to just kind of give us a little bit of a teaser about what kinds of things the book will reveal to us when we dig into it? Well, you know, I mean, I was totally charmed by Jerome Bernstein's (laughs) ability to bring together these disparate parts of his psyche, which is, you know, being, he describes himself as a fat Jewish boy from the the (laughs) East Coast who sort of by fate found himself with the Navajo in the Southwest. And his experience with the Navajo reconnected him to his Judaism. I mean, Who could figure that out? Who would ever guess at such a thing? But this happened because of of a dream and because of a synchronicity with the Navajo grandfather whom he was hanging out with. (laughs) Um, These kind of stories happen a lot in these essays. They, They happen over and over again, these synchronicities that just change a life in this uncanny and very powerful way, and you just don't know where it came from. 
but it becomes, you know, like like Patricia's Manitou, it becomes this profound thing that changes everything. Mm -hmm. And there is something about telling the story about it. I feel I love storytelling. And I know that when I wrote Farming Soul, A Tale of Initiation, that that storytelling really helped me pull together some things that I wouldn't have known about myself. And I know with the piece I wrote, The Soul is the Riddle Maker, in Mark by Fire, I also got that. But many people talked about that. And I think that when any of us start writing our story or telling our story, our unconscious helps us to see that that thread of how we got from here to here to here and that there really can be a meaning in it if we value it, if we let our consciousness hold it. I think that's what Jungian memoir serves. Is Right. And, and it also it changes your relationship to it. Yes. For example, in my piece, my relationship to Jung changed through the act of imagination I did with him in that piece. And at first I thought, you got to be nuts to be doing an act of imagination <laughs> with you. But the sister from below pops in and says, you got to do it, you know. What's this all about? <laughs> and and it's changed. I mean, I, I feel this closeness to Jung where it was always a little bit severed before because there was a battle in me between being a Jungian analyst and being a poet. They seemed like different callings, and Jung sure, you know, didn't put them all in the same boat. And But now we, we all live together really amicably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's a lovely testimony for integration, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least conversation. <laughs> uh, well, you know, the other thing I love, too, about hearing you talk about this is the underlying current of, of course, archetypes and mythology that just flows. You know, it seems like there's always something archetypal that sort of tends to float to the surface when you start digging into a person's life and their life experience. And again, so profoundly affecting when you really pay attention to where those kinds of patterns appear and the person who is actually engaged with those archetypes in order to be able to write as they do. Right, and and I'm just thinking in terms of another example of this, Jean Kirsch paper on the I Ching and I, I, you know, I actually heard that paper when she gave it at a dinner meeting, and I was just so taken by it because, you know, Jean is a very, very smart intellectual woman, and I haven't heard her talk so personally before, and I was so moved by yes. this yes. because she just allowed the I Ching to tell us, this, her and her relationship to it, to tell us the story of how she got together with her husband, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> And and it, she included a dream and these amazing synchronicities, and it gives you a feeling of how people in the Jungian world work with the I Ching, and it's amazing, really magical capacity to come from this wise, ancient, rooted place that none of us even, you know, that goes way back thousands of years and can guide us to this day. Yes. One thing that I really love about this collection is that there is so much feeling in it and a lot of humor. When Naomi and I were editing it in Truchis, each morning we would get up and we would read the papers aloud and do the editing that way. And we cried, we laughed. It was just an incredibly emotional experience to do it. And you could just feel the flow of life coming through it. Um, and it was an ecstatic experience. It me. was. It really was. Yes. And through the book, we have um, interwoven little these amazing little incidents that happened. <laughs> <laughs> that we call them Trucha stories. These yes. Just outrageous things that you just wouldn't even think are possible. Like I'm telling this story. I don't know where it came from in my head to Patricia about. Georgia O'Keeffe and how as a quite a young woman I saw her <laughs> retrospective and I loved her last painting which was a very beautiful simple painting called Winter Road with this stroke of of a line that indicated the road and I thought to myself in my 20s I want to live a life where I can get my art to the point where I can make that eloquent a statement that simply which really <laughs> before I knew the word individuation that was an image of individuation yeah. Meanwhile, my husband was out meeting these people at the Ghost Pony Gallery <laughs> who invited us all over for brunch, for Bloody Mary brunches on Wednesday morning, and we walk in there, 
And Leonardo, one of the artists whose gallery it was, had made chairs whose backs were in the form of iconic women. So we had Marilyn, and Patricia's husband, Donald, sat on Marilyn's lap, and we had Frida, and I got to sit on Georgia's lap. <laughs> and this happened to be a celebration of Samhain. That yes, time veil right, right. is the thinnest. So it definitely was thin. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, that's a great story. It sounds like you were well attended by the, the spirits and the ancestors. As you oh, mentioned. the spirits and the ancestors were totally with us. Yes. Yeah, that's fabulous. Well, speaking of that, I wanted to ask you about something else, because actually Patricia mentioned Don Fenner in passing, but I noticed that your book is actually dedicated to Don, and I believe both of you have known him. So, Naomi, can you share a little bit about Don Fenner and what his role is in all of this? Well, yes, both Patricia and I had relationships with Don and very different kinds of relationships. And mine was that I began consulting with him before I got into the Institute. But once I was in the Institute, he was incredibly important because at that time in the Institute, a lot of people were in love with object relations theory and they weren't talking about Jung and they weren't talking about archetypes. And I was going, where am I? And, and I, how do I survive this? And why, you know, what's going on here? But Don had a drumming every quarter in one of the candidates. She had a ranch and she had a barn, and um, and we would we candidates were all invited. Those of us who wanted to go to the drumming, and he did this Native American drumming to allow all of us to go into trance and to have visions. And that's exactly what I needed. And I was right in the archetypal realm. And he was just a master at holding all of us, at introducing us to it. He did this whole ritual. You know, I, I wrote a poem about this experience. He was very, very important in our community for holding the shamanic part of Jungian psychology. The, the direct experience of the unconscious. Right. He He really felt it was important that we know how to hold the direct experience of the unconscious, however that be, whatever your discipline be. Yeah, I think it's really powerful to have a mentor somewhere in your career, particularly early on, who can do that, because it's such a significant aspect of being able to actually help heal the world or bring healing to individual clients. Yes, and for me, I, I, he was also my consultant before I was a candidate at the Jung Institute. But when I entered, our institute was in a great a crisis, really, and the training was very difficult. And he took a group of us to the Southwest in 1991 for 10 days. And we, during the days, we would go, one day we went to the corn dance. We went to various of the sacred sites, Bandelier National Monument. We would sit in kivas and meditate, Chaco Canyon. And then in the evening, he would show us his Navajo sand paintings. He had studied for 16 years with a Navajo medicine man in Arizona. And then we would drum for an hour and a half. And for me, what I got from that was it was like being in heaven for 10 days. I really felt I, uh, this was an opportunity of a lifetime. I felt I was mentored into a whole other way of relating to life. And it was a natural way for me. It was something that I knew something about, but he took me a little bit further and he did it with this incredible graciousness. He did not charge us a cent for that 10 days. Mm. And he, at, at each meal, he would sit and answer questions. I mean, he truly was a teacher. So for me, I really learned something. Uh, the other thing I want to say is he was not a guru. He was able to hold all of himself, the dark and the light. He did not want to pretend to be any better than he was. So all of that together, it was really, it, it, it was being learning something through a teacher by what I think of as transmission. 
and and particularly around a relationship to the unconscious and to that other way really i think it's the being able to experience the manitou that that spirit well and like to me that's that he he lived in relation to the reality of the psyche yes and i think that when jung says the reality of the psyche he is talking about these things these experiences in the imaginal being real Yes. It's a different level of reality, but it is real. Yes. And absolutely. Don totally knew that. Yes. He lived there. Yes. And then he died very suddenly. It was a huge thing in our community. He died in, was it 97, Patricia, or 98? Yes, yes 97. He yes. had a heart on attack Christmas. on Easter. Yes. Easter Sunday morning. Easter Sunday morning. That was pretty devastating. It was. And many of us had had dreams that it would be passing. Our, I remember Pansy Hawkwing, the uh, Lakota medicine woman that many of us had worked with and Don had been in sweat lodges with her. She said that all of the medicine people knew of his death before they received the phone calls because wow. it went out mm-hmm. over the waves. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wow, that's quite profound. I can really see that he's had quite a tremendous influence on both of you and what a wonderful way to honor him by the publication of Marked by Fire, which yes. is so focused on the kind of work that he did and so dedicated to his spirit and his legacy, really. Yes. I can say on my end, I first heard of him through his anthology called The Sacred Heritage, mm-hmm. yes. The Influence of Shamanism on Analytical Psychology. And that was honestly one of my first introductions to the concept of shamanism with a scholarly approach, and it was Ah. so significant to me and very profound. So anyone who's interested in shamanism and aspects of shamanic thinking and practices and perspectives who is really looking for kind of a a scholarly approach to see how it fits with Jungian psychology, I Mm -hmm. highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. That came out of a conference that after we were in the Southwest, a group formed that studied the overlap of shamanism and analytical psychology. And the idea was that everybody had equal responsibility. We would present papers. We didn't, I think there were certain people we did pay, but for the most part, we were all equal participants. And we would meet for four days, most of the time in Winter Park with the idea that we would probably be publishing all or some of the papers. And that that book came out of that period of time. And he died shortly thereafter. Well, it was truly a a wonderful work for him to leave behind in addition Mm -hmm. to all of his other good works that were not necessarily communicated via writing, obviously. Yes, yes. Well, again, I I just am so glad for the publication of Marked by Fire. It's a very exciting work. I'm really happy to think that we're going to be focusing on this in the month of July in the Depth Psychology Alliance free online book club. And again, for anyone who's interested in that, please feel free to go to depthpsychologyalliance.com to join. And you can also find more information about the book club itself and about specifically the July offering with Patricia Damry and Naomi Lewinsky for Marked by Fire, Stories of the Union Way. You can find that on depthinsights.com and just click on the link for the book club at the top. And also I want to just share a little bit more information about Patricia and Naomi both so that if you would like to read more about the work that they do, you can find them. And for Patricia, you can read her blog at www.patriciadamry.com. And she also has a blog for the Grapes and Lavender Ranch, the biodynamic farming that she does along with her husband, and that's at Harms Farm Log, and that's spelled H-A-R-M-S-F-A-R-M Log, L-O-G, dot com. And, of course, for Naomi, she has a blog at www.sisterfrombelow.com, and that's where you can read a lot about her work and learn more about her books on poetry and other works. 
So I'm really grateful for both of you for being here and just sharing some of your experience of writing Marked by Fire with me. I do want to mention we're going to be doing a book launch for Patricia and Naomi for Marked by Fire in person in the Bay Area on July 28th of this year, 2012. So if anyone is in the area and would like to attend that, we're still working out details, but it will be somewhere in Marin County, just north of San Francisco over the Golden Gate Bridge, and that will be on July 28th, which is a Saturday in the afternoon. So please mark the date and then keep an eye on either or both depthinsights.com or depthpsychologyalliance.com to find out the details of that if you're interested in joining. So, Patricia and Naomi, both of you, thank you again so much for being here with me today. I so appreciate it. 